Uh, hello, my name is Stephen Roman. I'm the author of a new book called A Primer on Folding Knives. This book just came out in July of 2015. The website for the book is www.knifeprofessor.com. So I wanted to do a couple of YouTube videos to introduce the book to you. I tried to write this book so that both new and experienced knife users would find some useful information. Uh, for those who are just getting into knives for the first time, the first chapter describes the basics, starting with folding knife terminology and handle materials and pocket clips and so on. <clears throat> If you're an experienced knife user, so much of that material will be familiar to you. But there are still some things in the first chapter that you might find interesting. Uh, for example, I talk about how to get a scratch out of a DLC coated blade, which is not an easy thing to do. I show you the insides of various knife mechanisms, locking mechanisms, but also the IKBS and KVT ball bearing systems. Uh, that may be something you haven't seen. And I, sh I have some micrographs of blade finishes, which is kind of interesting and something you don't see very often. In any case, the other two chapters should be of interest to experienced knife users as well. So let's take a look at the inside of the book. I want to make an apology first <clears throat> my voice has been very hoarse lately. I'm not sure why. Maybe I'm getting a little laryngitis. So forgive me if I sound kind of raspy. Okay, so the preface is very short. Um, I show you a picture of a nice $25,000 folding knife. It's a beautiful knife. Uh, unfortunately, it's out of stock. So we're going to have to wait to buy one of those. Uh, I also say a little bit about myself, uh, just very briefly here. I'm a retired professor. <clears throat> I have been writing books for many years now. I've written about 40 books uh, in mathematics and computer programming. Some of those computer programming books were published by O'Reilly. You may have seen them. Um, I've also been a woodworker for about... 30 years, and so I've had a lot of experience with cutting tools and sharpening. This is a picture of one of my more elaborate pieces of furniture. It's a Newport block front. The photography is not too good, but I think you can see it. <clears throat> anyway, that's all I wanted to say about myself. Uh, this isn't about me, it's about the contents of my book. So here's a table of contents. Uh, Unfortunately, the book doesn't fit in the aspect ratio of my monitor, so I'll have to slide the pages up and down. As I said, the first chapter is uh, knife anatomy, operation, terminology, <clears throat> starting with a list of knife manufacturers for those who've never seen them. I talk about knife takedown, blade grinds, blade shapes, bevel angle carry positions, opening mechanisms, locking mechanisms. Blade lock issues like reliability, lock strength, ergonomics, <clears throat> handle materials, uh, blade construction, laminated blades, also Damascus blades different blade coatings and blade finishes, knife care, and a little bit about some exotic folders like karambits and balisongs. The second chapter is on steel metallurgy, <clears throat> the properties of steel, its composition, structure, heat treatment process, the effects of carbon on toughness and hardness, alloys and their effects on the final result of the blade, powder metallurgy. The message in this chapter is, uh, it, I didn't want to be too technical, obviously this is a technical subject, but I wanted to convey the issues involved in creating a high quality knife blade in terms of toughness, hardness, wear resistance, edge retention, those things. To give you an idea of what the challenges are 
and why there are so many different knife steels uh, and some excel at one or more properties and others excel at different properties. Third chapter is on knife sharpening. That's the most, I guess you'd say, controversial chapter because unlike the first two chapters, which are just fact-based, there are a lot of different opinions on how to sharpen knives. I tried not to be opinionated. Uh, my goal was to give you the options, basically. Describe the process of sharpening and give you the options you have for sharpening. Freehand sharpening with various types of uh, sharpening stones. Also, I talk about four different sharpening systems, the Edge Pro, the Wicked Edge, the KME, and the WorkSharp, and I compare their features uh, so you can make an, an informed decision about what you want to purchase. I also talk about stropping, which is a very interesting subject these days, especially with the advent of diamond emulsions, very fine emulsions down to 50 nanometers, and uh, different stropping media like kangaroo and horse butt and felt and nano cloth and so on. So let's uh, look at the introduction. This first video I want to go through the first chapter and I will make subsequent videos for the second and third chapter because uh, I don't want them to be too long. So the introduction uh, I talk about price guidelines and break down price ranges uh, <clears throat> into different categories. You can get a, a quite a decent knife, quite a good knife, even in the, the below $40, in the $20 to $40 range, if you choose very carefully. Um, this is an example of one such knife, which I talk about in the book. Uh, they are made in China for the most part, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are of poor quality. It's just a question of being very selective. I have different price ranges here. I talk about uh, it goes all the way up to over fifteen hundred dollars, and I showed you a picture of a twenty-five thousand dollar knife. So the the price range is quite dramatic, and it helps to have some sense of ways to categorize that price range. Of course, whether a knife is worth that kind of money is totally up to the person who's buying the knife. I don't own any really expensive knives, uh, and uh, they'd be fun to own, but, you know, uh, there comes a point where you pay so much for a knife, you don't want to use it. I don't think you'd want to cut up a bunch of cardboard boxes with a $2,000 folding knife. Uh, at least I don't think I would. So, I talk about knife usage, in collecting, investing, just using, talk about EDC knives, give some examples. EDC stands for Everyday Carry Knife. Chapter 1, as I said, list of knife manufacturers, knife anatomy. Here's a picture of a folding knife with all its parts called out. Uh, again, experienced users probably know all these terms, but if you're not experienced, uh, some of these terms may be unfamiliar to you. Here's another picture of the end of a knife, or the edge of the knife, so you can see some of the parts in there. So I go into some detail about these various parts of the knife. And I talk about primary and secondary grinds. There's some confusion about terminology there, which I try to address. Some of the newer knives, instead of using washers, are using ball bearing systems. I contacted the two major companies uh, that make those systems and talk to them about them so I could write about them. The IKBS and the KVT systems. This is a KVT washer system, a ball bearing washer system. I talk about knife takedown. There's some interesting things here. That uh, knife takedown refers to taking a knife apart, which you might do to clean the knife or to make some adjustments in the knife, like de assisting an assisted knife. Um, it's not something I recommend, but uh, I've done it myself, and if you're experienced at, at, uh, at knives and tinkering, I think you can probably get away with it. But there are a couple of 
caveats that you need to know about before you start. Uh, and I talk about those, and I mention that I had a discussion with uh, some tech support people at one of the largest of the knife companies who said that about 90% of all the knives they get back for repair come in a plastic bag of loose parts because people took their knives apart and weren't able to get them back together again. So that's something to keep in mind before you start doing things like that. Uh, talk about blade grinds, <clears throat> blade shapes, drop points, and sheep's foot, and so on. Talk about the belly of a knife, the recurve that some blades have. Talk about serrated blades and their advantages and disadvantages. Talk about bevel angle. This is an interesting story. I contacted several knife companies to find out uh, what their factory bevel angles were. And they vary quite a bit from somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 degrees up to maybe 22 degrees. So I talk about why those angles can be so different. I talk about carry positions, how to carry a knife, folding knife in your pocket with a pocket clip. There are four basic ways to do it, and uh, there are differences of opinion about what is the proper way in terms of safety issues and also deployment issues. I talk about pocket clips, the difference between standard and deep carry pocket clips. Opening mechanisms like the thumb hole and the thumb stud and the flipper. I also talk about the Kershaw, I'm, I'm sorry, the Emerson wave hook and how that works. You can see some pictures here. And I give some uh, video links. Uh, there are several links in the book to other YouTube videos that are interesting and links to other websites that have interesting material. Talk about assisted knives, what they are, automatic knives. Then I talk about locking mechanisms with pictures of both the outsides and the insides. This is a lock back from the top, inside with the blade open, inside with the blade closed. And I describe how that works. <clears throat> One really useful tip that I learned the hard way is how to close a lockback and how not to close it. For example, if you try to close a lockback this way, you push to close a lockback, you push the spring with your thumb. But if your fingers are like this and the pivot is not real tight, the blade is going to swing down and it can very easily cut you. That happened to me the first time I used, uh, I tried to close a lock back. I shouldn't admit this, but it happened to me the second time too. Uh, before I realized that all you have to do is move your finger, your uh, index finger up towards the front of the handle so that this flat part of the blade called the choil will come down on your finger rather than the sharp part of the blade. So anyway, that's a good tip if you don't know it. Um, liner locks with some illustrations to show how they work with the detent ball and so on. Frame locks and how they work. Compression lock, axis lock, and here's a picture of the inside for an axis lock and how that works button locks, which are less common, but here's a picture of a beautiful knife with a button lock. I do talk about my preferences. Uh, I've tried in this book not to be opinionated, as I said before, but I don't think it's unreasonable for me to occasionally say what I like and don't like in general terms because it might get you to think about what you like and don't like. It might make some points that help you make a decision. So I do that. Uh, <clears throat> then blade lock issues, including lock strength, 
lock reliability, handle materials, oh, uh, lock ergonomics, a little bit about design flaw possibilities, handle materials like G10. G10 is an interesting handle material because it can it can be how should I say plain and it it's quite a common lock handle material on medium or inexpensive priced knives but it can also be polished and this isn't a good photograph because of the glare but it can be uh, polished and look quite beautiful and uh, appear on some high-end custom knives like this one this is FRN, also a common knife material. Micarta. I, I don't own a folding knife with a Micarta handle, so this is a picture of Micarta on a fixed blade knife. This is carbon fiber, which is one of my favorite handle materials. Blade construction. This is a laminate blade. This is a Damascus blade. I talk a little bit about very briefly about the history of the Damascus blade. It's pretty interesting. Blade coatings, including uh, DLC and B4C and TICN. It's all explained here. Some pictures. Blade finishes, bead blasted, stone washed, black washed, and others. And here are those micrographs I mentioned earlier showing what these coatings look like at a microscopic level. Talk about knife and blade care. Here's my story about scratches on a DLC. I um, went to a store, a knife store, and I saw a knife I really liked. It's a beautiful knife, not an inexpensive one, and it was all DLC, black diamond-like coating. The handle, the blade, everything was the same coating. And I re really wanted to buy that knife, but it had a scratch. It had been at a knife show a few days before it got to the store, and there was a fairly nasty scratch on the handle. Uh, this, the store said I could return the knife if I really wasn't happy, so I bought it, and I called the company, and I said can you do something about this scratch? And their answer was no. I said, that you'll just have to live with it. So I got to thinking that since the knife had been at a show, it was handled a lot, it's possible that somebody with a ring on had handled the knife and scratched the handle. But DLC is a very hard coating. They don't call it diamond-like coating for nothing. And so probably the scratch was the result of a metal deposit on top of the DLC. So I tried a few simple things uh, to remove the scratch. It wasn't working. Obviously, I didn't want to use anything really harsh because I didn't want to scratch the handle. I started poking around on the internet and I found something called Ballastol, which is a uh, solvent, I guess, for for a dissolving metal and <clears throat> I bought some on Amazon some wipes that were impregnated with balisol and well, I took my knife uh, I rubbed the wipe on the scratch a little bit put two pieces of wood between so I made a knife sandwich a knife balisol sandwich two pieces of wood on the outside below the knife and above the balisol wipe and I clamped them together, not firmly, but not too tight. And I let it sit overnight. And the next day, I was able to take a toothbrush with a little more ballastol and remove the scratch. So that was a tip that maybe will help you someday. <clears throat> Lubrication, thorough cleaning, and finally, exotic folders, the karambit. That's an interesting knife. Uh, it's modeled after a cat's claw. Obviously not a house cat, a big cat. And uh, the way you hold a ballast, uh, <coughs> a, uh, a karambit, is this way, with the blade coming down from your fist. This isn't 
a karambit, obviously. And you put your index finger through this hole. You can also hold it in this orientation with the blade uh, uh, edge facing out. Uh, <clears throat> the peaceful use for this thing is to slice open uh, sacks of grain, for example, or maybe boxes and things. It's also, it also has defensive use. Because your index finger is through this ring, it would be very hard for someone to disarm you with this uh, weapon. So that's, that's the Karambit story. Balasong is a, is a totally different story, and I think I can't really do justice to a Balasong in writing, I, so I think the best thing to do, as I mentioned, is to go to YouTube and do some searching for Bala songs and watch some of the people who use them. It's really amazing what they can do with a Bala song. This knife is a combination. Uh, <clears throat> it's a karambit Bala song crossover. So, okay, so that's, that completes the first chapter, and I hope that wasn't too boring. Uh, I will do a video on the other two chapters, as I said, and thanks for watching.